Monerotopia Weekly News segment is sponsored by IVPN. Use a VPN to help prevent your online activity from becoming a permanent record. IVPN encrypts your data and DNS requests so your ISP or mobile network provider cannot monitor or log your online activity. Purchase an IVPN service today anonymously with Monero. Okay, a lot of new stories. Tony isn't here, so I actually really haven't had time to take a good look at them. But uh, so I'll be learning the news with you guys. So first story, Pakistan banks agree on blockchain based KYC system development. The blockchain national eKYC banking platform aims to strengthen anti-money laundering capabilities while countering terror financing. So Pakistan, uh, the Pakistan banks are putting in a national KYC system, it seems like, um, for blockchain. How exciting, guys. Uh, luckily, we Monero, right? We're not planning on using the Pakistani banking uh, crypto banking system the the bank the pakistan banks association a group of 31 traditional banks operating in pa pakistan signed off on developing a blockchain based know your customer uh platform on march 2nd the pba signed the project contract to develop pakistan's first blockchain based national kyc banking platform the move aims to strengthen anti-money learning capabilities while countering terror financing an initiative led by the state bank. So they're they're using the technology of crypto to better improve tracking and tracing of transactions for the proposed purpose of countering terrorist financing. Will it accomplish that? Sure, potentially, but what else will it do? It will track and trace everyone's transactions. This is something those most of those i would say in monero fear and why we're so passionate about monero we don't want to live in this dystopia uh kind of a one world government where all transactions are perfectly tracked and traced but there is a portion of society a very strong and powerful portion that is trying to push us all in that direction this is just the latest example of that the member banks included international establishments such as the Industrial Commercial Bank uh, of China, Citibank, and Dutch Bank. More of the blockchain platform will improve operational efficiencies, primarily aimed at improving customer experience during onboard. So isn't that nice? Our, our customer experience will be improved. Pakistan based... Uh, the Ivana Group has been tasked to develop the blockchain-based KYC platform named cons Consonance? consonants which will be used by member banks to standardize and exchange customer data via decentralized and self-regulated network however the customer details will be shared based on consent allowing banks to assess as existing and new customers joining other countries in the race to develop a central bank digital cur currency pakistan recently signed new laws to ensure the launch of a cbdc by 2025 crazy the spb will issue licenses to electronic money institutions for cbdc issuance these landmark regulations are a testament to the sbp's commitment toward openness adoption of technology and digitization of our financial system said deputy governor of spb um yeah man so it's it's more of this same news their their cbdc is scheduled to launch in 2025 we're already seeing test nets up around the world some of them are already launched uh we haven't seen great adoption in nigeria but you know like i've said my pushback there is yes uh we're not seeing you know the plebes in, uh, in nigeria jump onto the cbdc system yet but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen uh the way these things are going to work is people are going to be funneled into these systems through coercion and force by the government. Uh, they're going to slowly turn the screws and they're going to force people to onboard. Uh, next story, Iran, Iran completes a pre-pilot phase of central bank digital currency. Here you go. So they just had their, their pre-pilot phase. The central bank of Iran progresses with CBDC development in anticipation of a visit by the bank of Russia's governor. Iran, uh, Iran is moving forward with the central bank digital currency plans, completing preliminary research for the launch of a potential digital real. The central bank of Iran has completed a pre-pilot phase in the development of Iran CBDC, 
according to an official statement by CBI's research arm. Um, head of CBI Office for Supervising Payment Systems announced the news at the 9th Annual Conference of Electronic Banking. He noted that Iran Central Bank plans to increase the scope of the CBDC pilot in the country's payment system, but doesn't want to rush its implementation. The pre-pilot phase ended successfully with valuable achievements. The project will soon be launched in other ecosystems and will be used by more users. So here we go. You know, they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to onboard people. The executive pointed out that the rules governing a potential digital real will align with those established for the real banknotes. Manny Yekta also noted that a digital real would be distributed among individuals and banks with the CBDC infrastructure, recreating some blockchain features. Uh, Manny Yakta reported, reportedly said that 10 banks in Iran have applied to join the digital real project. Banks like Bank Malil, Bank Malata, Bank Tajarat were involved in the experimental phase. All banks and credit institutions in Iran are reportedly expected to start offering electronic wallets for using the upcoming digital currency. Wow, all banks in Iran are reportedly expected to start offering the electronic wallets that are going to allow people to use these CBDCs. As previously reported, the CBI started planning to launch the CBDC pilot in January 2022, following years of initial research since 2017. The regulator, you know, when we were talking about it back then, it, it seemed like it was it was so far away in the future, right? That we may may see these things, CBDCs. It was it was theoretical back in 2017 when they were tinkering with it. But here it is, guys. The regulator reportedly started rolling out a CBDC pilot in September 2022, aiming to improve financial inclusion and compete with global stable coins. Oh, so it's all because they want to make it more inclusive, guys. That's why. It's not that they want to track and trace all our transactions and can perfectly control the monetary system. It's they want to make a more inclusive system. Um, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, Iran's digital real project called the crypto real a, uh, called the crypto real is pegged to the national currency. The Iranian real at a one to one ratio. The digital currency reportedly runs on a platform known as Borna, which was developed using Hydroledger Fabric, the open source enterprise blockchain platform established by United States technology giant IBM. Okay, so IBM is behind this. They built the quote unquote blockchain tech that this Iran CBDC is being built on. The news comes among the Iranian authorities preparing to hold an official meeting with the Bank of Russia's governor who is expected to visit Iran in the near future. Russia and Iran will reportedly be working together to create a gold-backed stablecoin. This is interesting. That would serve as a payment method in foreign trade, right? So uh, Russia is, as we know, is scrambling to essentially devalue the U.S. dollar. Um, one way to do that is, you know, to launch this idealistic gold-backed uh stable coin right um it's it's interesting the competition we're seeing among states and cryptos hopefully the best and purest will win obviously governments and states will try their damnness to prevent things like monero from succeeding but given the technology i think we're all confident that it will in the end rise to the top the cream will rise to the top but they're going to try their damnness to stop it along the way and what i think is interesting they're going to try to compete with it along the way too right so there's, there's going to be two two ways they're going to try to stop things like bitcoin and monero one is you know just through strong regulations through coercion through for making it difficult for people not to use true cryptos and the second is to compete with features so a gold back stable coin might sound pretty good to some if it's state controlled, right? It sounds very reliable. Uh, it might be more reliable than the US dollar, right? That's what that's what they're intending, right? To create this kind of perfectly quote unquote stable crypto. Um Next story. This is a big one. We, we brought this up a little bit during the development section. Monero transaction confirmations are now 60, sen 60 seconds faster. Thanks to Hashvolt, Monero Ocean, Support XMR, and Nanopool. 
On January 19th, this is a post by Rucknium, by the way. So he's the one who kind of pretty much pushed this initiative forward. He will be speaking at Monerotopia. He'll be giving a presentation. This is, as far as I know, this is the first time he will be publicly presenting. Uh, he, he's going to remain anonymous. He's going to do it remotely, but he's going to put on a presentation. He's going to disguise his voice, I believe. Rucknium really uh, strives to stay anonymous and we totally support that and encourage that. He's an extremely valuable asset in the Monero community. And it's important that guys like him or gals uh, stay stay anonymous so it's more difficult for any type of state coercion to, to enter into the Monero development sphere. Obviously, there's those that aren't anonymous, um, but it's nice that we have kind of this underbelly of of devs that are working anonymously behind the scenes and staying out of harm's way. On January 19th, I released research showing mining pools were delaying the first confirmations of Monero transactions by a full minute on average. I said the delay could be eliminated if pool operators changed their pool software configurations to update the block template more frequently. I have good news. Most major pools did exactly that. Uh, I continue to collect the transaction confirmation data after the release of the initial analysis. The average time that a Monero transaction has to wait for its first confirmation has fallen from 3.5 minutes to 2.5 minutes. That's a full minute improvement in less than two months. The plot below shows the quicker confirmation times. So this is really cool, right? And within two months, we're seeing a, a, a drop of one minute, 60 seconds in Monero transaction confirmation. Uh, you know, this is like the type of thing, you know, a, a, a white swan event, I guess you would call it. Like, you know, it's something that happens out of nowhere, right? That you see these large step function improvements in Monero, right? That things happen. But there's really smart people working on this project in an open source manner, and you just don't know what's going to happen next, right? It's not stagnant. It's not like you can't look at this and be like, oh, it's not going to scale. It's not going to. I mean, there's arguments as to why theoretically it does scale anyway. But even ignoring the architecture of Monero itself, discount, you can't discount the fact that it's current, always under development. And there's really intelligent people that are constantly trying to prove it. And here's just an example of that. So overnight, we're seeing improvements in Monero's transaction confirmation times. This isn't something anybody would have predicted because how would you? It was essentially kind of discovered and then implemented. So very exciting to see. And we're very, very proud and happy to have Ruck Diem as a speaker of Monerotopia. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Super excited for that. Very excited. We're actually creating a whole second stage for remote speakers. And this is going to allow us to fit everybody in at the conference. Because I think we're we're all approaching like thirty speakers, if you include remote and people that will be in person and all the projects. Uh, that's a lot, guys. That's a lot of speakers. So Monerotopia twenty two in Miami. Anybody that was there knows it was it was amazing. It was fantastic, but it was a freaking marathon. That's why we did move. We created two days of conference for this one, but it's going to be just as just as jam packed, except for two days. So it's going to be more of a marathon. Actually, correction, not two days, because now we're adding the uh, a third day, right? So originally Friday was going to be just a welcome party, but it's now essentially going to be the beginning of the conference because we just don't have time. And we we managed when Sunina went down to the venue, uh, she's down there now, she was able to land Friday completely. So we'll actually begin setting up hopefully even Thursday night. Friday, we'll continue setting up. And then by Thursday afternoon, we'll open it up for people to start coming in and hanging out. Hopefully around like three o'clock, people can shuffle in, get their badges or whatever, whatever we're going to use for um, as a swag item to determine who's part of the conference. And we'll have a little party, a DJ on day one. We'll have drinks flowing and we'll have at least three to four talks that day. Uh, there'll be maybe more lighthearted in terms of not like deep, like technical talks, but just kind of more philosophical uh, talks about why why Monero is important, why crypto is important, why we're all in this to begin with. So that, that should be really cool. But we have to actually do it just so we can fit in all the talks. 
Uh, next story, coincards.com. Here's a breakdown. Coincards will be remotely participating. Another example, they're, they're gonna, they'll be on the remote stage. Uh, they're going to give a quick little lightning talk just to give us an update on Coincards, and they'll be part of Adoption Alley. Here's a breakdown of usage by volume on Coincards by percentage of February 23. BTC is at 40.8%, and XMR is at 17%. So that's the global number. So XMR is number two, coming in at 17%. In Canada, we, we've always found this strange, right? But there are, you know, people do have some uh, theories as to why this is the case. BTC number one, Ethereum number two, and LTC number three, and then XMR number four. Uh, so, so the status of, of Canada are not, are not adopting Monero as quickly as the liberty-loving individuals of the USA, where Monero is by far number one exceeding even BTC by a tremendous amount at 62.7% of all USA coin card usage is Monero. And the second is Bitcoin at only 15%. That is tremendous. That is tremendous. Let's get Monero up to number one globally. It just makes sense, right? If you're using crypto for the purposes of transacting and buying things anonymously, for example, a gift card, why wouldn't you be using Monero for those purposes? So slowly, I think people are realizing that, as, as we all know here. Next story, uh, our beloved son Chakar, Sunita, my wife, was on Bitfinex's show giving a talk. She did an amazing job. Uh, I didn't watch it. I just kind of heard her from the other room uh, when she was doing it. So guys, definitely check that out. Give her some, give her some love and support. It was very good. Um, yeah. And that she, she ran the meetup last night. Sunita, Sunita is on fire right now. I don't know what happened. I, I like, I, I think she's, she's trying to take over Monero talk, Monero topia. I don't know what's going on guys. So if I disappear, Sun Chakra is the main suspect. Um, she, she's taken over next story, solo travel to Monero topia. Somebody just posted this on Reddit. This is kind of funny. Somebody's saying, is it safe to travel down to Mexico City on your own? Uh, I plan on traveling solo from the United States to Mexico City by plane from an Aerotopia, assuming plane ticket prices come down a little in May. Uh, I don't know about that, but whoever this is, uh, the, the, if you're going to come, just buy your tickets now. You know, you don't, don't, they're probably not going to come down. They're going to go up. That's usually how things work. Uh, I'm a little worried about my safety in Mexico City alone, at least based off the news. I know of it's. I know it's exaggerated, which has been talking about increased cartel violence and kidnapping of travelers coming from the United States. So I like to get the Monero community's opinion on the topic of safety. So I mean, obviously this is very reasonable, right? People are concerned about their safety, and I I, I get that. We're not trying to put anybody in danger. But just, you know, real world example, Sunita is down there, you know, knock on wood. You know, I hate saying this because you don't want to, you know, but she's down there. She's safe. She's having a great time. We've been down there multiple times. She's down there by, you know, by herself. Right? We have some friends down there. But for the most part, she's, she's traveling by herself. Safe. The Roma district of Mexico City is a very safe area. Um, there's, you know, you, you don't you don't feel safe walking around the streets. Obviously, you don't, you know, you gotta you have your wits about you. It's part of a major city. Mexico City is a tremendous metropolis. It's like I don't know, like over 13 million people, much larger than than New York City than Manhattan. There's areas of it that you would definitely not want to go into as a as somebody who's not from there, right? Um, but the Roma district, very safe. You see police all over the place walking the streets. They really actively try to keep it safe. And it's actually just very calm. You know, part, there's parts of Mexico City that have tons of traffic and kind of air air pollution because of all the traffic. But the Roma district is this beautiful little area of the city. It's kind of more of a village-esque. It's more like the like the West Village in, in Manhattan. They keep it very nice. So knock on wood. Uh, it's It's beautiful. So just get down to Roma. Get an Airbnb. The Airbnbs are very safe and beautiful. The weather is amazing. Although yeah. it will tech up. Oh, so you just jumping on. What's I'm up? Here. No, I'm, no, I'm just talking. I'm listening to what you're saying. 
did, did you see this you post? You know, I, I don't want to like push our luck and say, you know, guys, obviously, guys, be safe. I, I no, be safe, guys. Everyone, obviously. Yeah, I respect safe, the people are so asking far... this question. Go ahead, Nita. No, yeah. I mean, be safe. I mean, but be safe everywhere, right? Everywhere you travel. Um, but for the most part, thankfully, it's been kind of good. You right. know, I, you were at the, myself. the meetup last night that you ran. I mean, were there any, were there yeah. any sketchy vibes or? No, no. Knock on wood again. I don't want to jinx myself, but everyone was super sweet. Everyone's super nice here. You know, I, I walked at night and, you know, obviously don't walk too late. Um, I felt safe. I felt good. My hotel that I'm staying at, which is actually one of the hotels that we suggested, was the most the more affordable one. Love it so far. Been there for three days. So it was the, the Blanca. Casa Blanca or something, right? What is it? Casa Blanca. Yeah, yeah. That one I'm staying at. Really nice. Uh, everyone there is very nice. Rooms are clean. Very, very close to the venue. It's literally like a five-minute walk. Um, so far, so good, guys. So, again, you know, take precautions. Yeah, Anywhere guys. Anywhere you go, to be honest. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Guys, definitely check out. And, and don't forget, we're going to be there together as a clan, right? So, you know, you'll for the most part, you'll be around other people. If you want to wander off, you're taking a risk, right? If you want to wander off, yeah. I mean, Sunita and I did it when we went down to Mexico City. We, we like trekked the city, you know. Yeah. But we we were aware of what we were getting ourselves into. Sunita speaks Spanish very well, um, and so we, we we like doing those types of things. And it's the people are just beautiful, wonderful, loving people, uh, which which they which say for most people, people around the world, right? And uh, and in particular, this area of Roma, it's just very nice. Like, there's like no pollution, right? There's no, no, um, there's no garbage on the street. It's clean, a lot. Cleaner. Very, very clean. Manhattan, the New York City. Uh, you don't see homeless people on the streets. Not that there aren't homeless people in Mexico City, but for whatever reason, they keep that area very clean and nice. I mean, perhaps that's controversial because I, I don't know how they're they're accomplishing that. But uh, you walk around that part of the city, and it's it feels like you're in one of the best places you can be. Um, oh, and yeah, and that we highly recommend that hotel because it's very cheap. It's like what, forty bucks a night? Very cheap. Yeah, it was like forty bucks a night, and the like only I said very clean. People were really nice. The only um, thing they have, is, they have it's... a restaurant on the first floor. Sorry, right? <laughs> it's, 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 the hotel. I really enjoyed it. it's difficult to get a room because on when you go to their website or the Google, when you go to the Google on Maps, Google, yeah. And you, their number is incorrect. So we're gonna put the correct number up because Sunita literally went down, took the Uber there, and like showed up in person. And we're like, "Why aren't you guys answering the freaking phone?" Um, so we'll get the correct number up there. And I think through their website itself, they have the correct number at least, right? But call them up on and their website. Yes, go to their website, and that's the correct number. Do not click on call on Google Maps because. I don't know where it takes you to take you there. All the hotels we recommend are really good, but this one's the best for your yeah, this is, in terms of overall. Yeah. Like super close, super cheap, and very like nice. Not like not sketchy at all or yeah, dirty. Or it. Beautiful. Um, next story, Nita. Let me keep going here. Uh, Biden budget proposes thirty percent tax on crypto mining electricity usage. So this is part of the big stories that we're seeing this week. Uh, there seems to be a lot of crackdown or inklings of it about to happen in you know for crypto in the united states this is one of the major stories united states crypto miners could eventually be subject to a 30 percent tax on electricity costs under a budget proposal by president joe biden aimed to reduce mining activity so they want to add a tax to anybody that's using electricity for mining purposes in the u.s a 30 percent tax that's crazy. A Department of Treasury supplemented budget explainer paper release margin said any firm using resources, whether they be owned or rented, would be subject to an uh, excise tax equal to 30% of the cost of electricity used in digital asset mining. So we, we saw things in, in, in uh, different states, especially New York State. There was, uh, they were trying to ban, essentially ban um, crypto mining in New York. Um, by way of passing a bill they, that would prevent the retrofitting of old utility uh, power authorities 
for purposes of retrofitting them for crypto mining because they didn't like that it was quote unquote being used to create magic internet money and burn fossil fuels, right? So they wanted to stop that, right? Which is absurd, right? This is technology. The government shouldn't be telling us how we use our energy in the first place. It, the market should be telling us how we use our energy. If people want to use, have demand for using energy for these purposes, then we should allow the market to do that, right? Uh, and the government's putting a tax on that to try to prevent the natural tendency of the market to want to use scarce resources for purposes of uh, mining crypto and supporting the network. So it's interesting. It's interesting that they have to go to these uh, great extents to try to stop crypto by, for example, now implementing a tax on anybody that wants to mine. In the pro uh, uh, it proposed the tax would be implemented after December 31st, phased in over three years at a rate of 10% a year, reaching max 30% rate. 30. So you know, there's, there's so much to be said here, guys. This is like what we're talking about, right? Bitcoin miners in particular are susceptible to something like this. They're ASIC mined. They're becoming more centralized in ways. And those that argue otherwise, here's a perfect example. The government is able to effectively overnight implement a tax on the entire Bitcoin mining ecosystem in the United States, you know, with the, uh, with, with really nothing stopping them. Um, and that to me, that's a sign of Bitcoin being susceptible to government coercion. So they're able to easily implement this tax because for the most part, all crypto miners in the US are major uh, companies that use ASICs that are easily easy to, to find and easy to send a letter to and easy to come collect their taxes on. And so they're uh, using coercion to force these companies to comply with these new taxes. It's going to lead to, I'm sure, you know, regulatory capture, essentially. Those companies that are already large will stay large and they'll essentially, potentially, uh, why it's a tax uh, could benefit from things like this, making it more difficult from smaller companies to compete. And just the fact that they're able to do this versus something like Monero, which is, as of today, CPU mineable only, right? Um, there is this, in Monero, the CPU is, is the ASIC. There aren't any large ASIC farms mining Monero. You can uh, compete with your CPU in the Monero network permissionlessly. And effectively, what that does is prevent things like this, where overnight a government can have an effect in the entire mining industry for your crypto. We saw it happen in China, right? Where China stepped in overnight, they banned essentially banned Bitcoin mining. And what happened? Bitcoin, the, the hash rate plummeted. They were able to do this. The government was able to do this because they were very easy for them to round up all the Bitcoin miners, very easy to get the word out and enforce that when all the Bitcoin miners are companies with warehouses of large miners that need to bend the knee to the state if they want to exist. So overnight, the hash rate plummeted and Bitcoiners, what was their take? Oh, well, look, look what happened. All the hash rate moved to the US. That so shows you how how uh, unstoppable Bitcoin is, right? They shut it down in, in China and it moves to the US. I think that's a really kind of asinine way of looking at it. What it showed is the state's ability to have influence over the, the mining network, uh, as exemplified by the state of China shutting it down overnight. And yes, the US picked it up, but that doesn't mean the US could essentially do the same thing. And here they are doing just that. Now, are they banning Bitcoin mining overnight? No, but they're greatly co-opting it and affecting it overnight. Um, and so that's my takeaway for this story. It's just a, another feather in the cap for Monero and its mission to be essentially mined by CPUs. One CPU, one vote is the goal. And it's 
a very powerful goal and it will allow the network to stay decentralized. It's going to be, imagine if the US government wanted to ban all Monero mining. So they would essentially be exercising a 30% tax on anybody that's using electricity to run a computer. So just think about that. Uh, and I don't think that's going to happen, guys. It'd be very difficult. If it if they tried to do it, it'd be extremely difficult to, um, you know, in practice, carry it out. Next story, U.S. government's 1 billion Bitcoin transfer spooks investors. Bitcoin dips. So this was interesting. People were, were following the money as they always do in Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin dipped. This is a little bit of old news for the week and early Wednesday because, you know, news happened so fast in Bitcoin. But this happened this week as well. Uh, Bitcoin dipped to 22,000 since dipped much further because of other catastrophes that's happened. Early ones are after authorities moved some of the Bitcoin to Coinbase controlled wallets. So people got scared. They saw the US authorities transferred 1 billion worth of Bitcoin recovered from a dark web hack to new wallet addresses, including one owned by Coinbase. So everybody's watching the US government move the money to Coinbase and I guess speculating that it's going to be sold off. Which is kind of unique because traditionally, anytime the U.S. government has obtained Bitcoin through coercion, of course, taking it away from people, uh, people that uh, did illegal things, they came and took away their their Monero. I mean, their Bitcoin. I'm sorry. Well, um, you know, this unconfiscatable asset seems to be confiscated quite a bit, quite a bit. This this asset that's claimed to be uh, impossible to to confiscate. Uh, it seems like when the US government wants it, they go ahead and go get it. So recently, we're seeing a billion dollars worth that they have from a dark web hack. And like I said, traditionally, the way the government's handle is they've, they've auctioned it off. They've auctioned off their Bitcoin, which have caused uh, you know ripples in the market. But now the ripples in the market are coming from watching the US government move their Bitcoin to what appear, you know, appears to be Coinbase. Uh, and I, you can only guess for the purposes of, I guess, liquidating it. I don't know how the legalities of that and why now they're able to just sell it versus doing an auction. I, I'm not following the story, these things too closely. I don't know if there has been any movement in terms of them actually selling. Um, people can bring me up to speed on that in the comments if, if anybody knows. Uh, but, you know, this is just kind of another story of Bitcoin being com completely traceable. And this is one of the features of it. And you can watch Bitcoin as they move, even a billion dollars worth that's controlled by the government, and it spooks the entire market. Wait till Satoshi's coins move. Then we'll then we'll see a real spook in the marketplace. Um, not that that would ever happen, guys, but you never know. You never know. Getting crypto firms to do their work within the bounds of the law. Gary Gensler wrote an opinion piece on the 9th. So three, two days ago, um, on kind of the, the state of crypto and crypto regulation and just kind of coming out and whining and saying, you know, it's securities, everything's security. Nobody's listening to me. I told everybody it was security. Um, we've been clear that most crypto tokens that are backed by entrepreneurs, among other features, are likely to be securities. So he's saying the vast majority of all crypto is considered a concern. We've been clear how lending and staking platforms come under the securities laws. We've been clear that platforms listing crypto securities must register with the SEC. Further, the securities laws are clear that these platforms are not to combine functions under a single umbrella that creates conflicts of risk for investors. So he's just coming down, reminding everybody that he thinks everything is a security. I still, I think my, you know, I think his only exception is Bitcoin. And I think he's, I think he's labeled, thrown Ethereum in that, in that mix as like saying no Ethereum. I think he's come out and said that. Um, but, you know, that can change. Which leads to the next story. New York Attorney General alleges Ether is a security in KuCoin lawsuit. Um, so they're basically coming out for purposes of going after KuCoin for uh, illegal securities trading, right? They're, they're an exchange. And one of the allegations against them is that they're allowing people to trade securities illegally. And one of those securities allegedly being Ether. 
So in the court case, uh, or the New York Attorney General is for the, for this case to essentially have have merit or grounding, uh, they're considering trying to label ETH as a security. A press release said the lawsuit was part of ongoing efforts to crack down on unregistered cryptocurrency platforms. New York State Attorney G General Latita James, she just obviously doesn't really love crypto that much, filed suit against KuCoin on Thursday, alleging the, the Seychelles-based crypto exchange is violating security laws by offering tokens, including Ether. So they're including Ether in that mix of what they're calling tokens, right? They're not labeling, they're not saying, oh, except Ether, it's like Bitcoin, it's not a security, it's something else. That must meet the definition of a security without registering with the attorney general's offices. So because this exchange is allowing people to trade uh, tokens, including Ether, they're saying they you know need to register with the SEC before people can exchange securities. The suit is the first time a regulator has claimed in court that Ether is a security. So we're starting to, oh, and here we go. Through Securities and Exchange Commission, Chairman Gary Gensler has hinted that his agency might consider Ether to be a security. Okay, so this is news to me, because I, I know he, I thought he had kind of put it in the Bitcoin basket of not being a security. Obviously we're seeing Letitia James, New York State General, uh, moving Ether over, trying to move Ether over into the security basket. And it appears that Gary Gensler, the SEC chairman, is also agreeing and hinting at that. The SEC's sister regulatory agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, has long maintained that both Bitcoin and Ether are commodity assets. So we have these different regula regula regulatory bodies. You know, this has been happening since day one of well not day one of crypto but in the early days of crypto we were trying to figure out how to define it and obviously every regulatory body has the incentive to define it on their own terms right um so that their regulations apply to it but this is interesting i mean this is this is tremendous news if eth becomes uh labeled a in, considered a security in the eyes of the United States government. James Suit argues that Ether is considered a security under the Martian Act, a 102-year-old New York anti-fraud law that gives the Attorney General powers to investigate securities fraud and bring both civil and criminal actions against violators. Because the value of Ether is dependent on the efforts of others, including co-founder Vitalik Buren. So, um, you know, you got the, what is it, the Howey test? So this is a, one of the arms of the Howey test. This is what they're focusing in on this concept of the value of Ether is dependent on the efforts of others. So if there's others that are uh, behind uh, an asset that are are building it and have the, in, uh, that are incentivized to build it for the purposes of profiting, then the selling of that asset is can be considered a, a security or traditionally has been. And so, you know, with Bitcoin, the argument is, well, there are no, you know, there is nobody behind it. Satoshi was anonymous. It it developed in this in this way where there's no company or group that stands to benefit from it. It's open source. It is a product of nature, right? It, it just came, it just organically came to be, as opposed to something like Ethereum, which has a CEO, essentially Vitalik. He is the face of Ethereum. He is the creator of Ethereum. He is the visionary. He's the one that pitched Ethereum to the world and then sold it, right? I remember I was there. Granted, I should I should have bought some, but I didn't. I didn't want to spend. My I was BTC Maxi at the time, and uh, for one Bitcoin, which at the time I remember uh, was valued around three hundred dollars, would get you two thousand Ethereum in the Ethereum presale. So they had a presale for Ethereum. I remember that. I mean, that's that sounds a little bit security ish, right? They're pre-selling, um, um, you know, to so this group of people that stands to benefit from the price we're out there selling it in a in a pre-sale get come and get your ethereum before we launch <sighs> frankly i don't know how it's not considered a security i don't want to be i don't want to be labeled somebody who's rooting for any cryptos to be labeled securities because you know screw them but the fact is 
this is how states are going to operate. So I'm rooting for Monero and or other cryptos that are built in such a way that they're resistant to these labels. Um, and then even more so, even if they are labeled in this way, are resistant to practically being stopped. Uh, and ETH doesn't seem to really fall into this category of being a technology that can't be co-opted by the state. Uh, Bitcoin, not either. According hey, I, yes. I was wondering if I could um, say something about ETH really quick. Go so for it. <clears throat> the way that it was um, the way that it was sold, definitely there's a good case to be made that it was sold as an investment contract. Mm -hmm. And almost certainly if there's a court case, that's probably what the SEC will argue. And I believe that's what they're arguing with Ripple right now, that the thing that they sold was an investment contract. But that's also a slightly different consideration than whether or not ETH is presently a security in its current form. Mm -hmm. More likely than not, um, it would it would almost certainly be ruled as currently not a security for the people holding it and using it. But um, it might have been sold as a security. So that's kind of a fine distinction there. Yeah, but it's it's a distinction that's up to the powers that be to make, right? So I, I understand the logic there, but on what side are they going to come down, right? Um, we don't know. And I, honestly, my 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 hunch is I agree with you. I don't I don't think I don't think ETH will be labeled. Although with this this recent news is pretty is pretty damning. Um, they're trying to, I mean, what do, what do you think, body of this? I mean, we have the attorney general in New York alleging that ETH is a security. So I, they might, there's probably a lot of things that they can do, a lot of power they might have merely on the allegation um, that probably gives them a lot of leverage. I think that the Ripple case is going to be very instructive for us, um, how that turns out. It looks to me like the SEC has bumbled this case in almost every way possible. Now, maybe that's like, maybe that's on purpose. Um, Jesse Powell had a very good tweet the other day where he said that um, bureaucracies like the SEC, they tend to let the bad guys continue operating and they're, they say, oh, we're, you know, we're investigating, we're collecting more information, we need more. But then they go after the little guys, the good guys that are actually like trying to comply. Guys like um, uh, I think Reggie Middleton uh, is a famous name out there or some famous name that he tried to comply. He talked to them for two years. He tried to do everything right. And then they attacked him anyways. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of sort of hidden agendas going on. It could very well be that Gary Gensler is, um, you know, it might be, or maybe not just Gary Gensler, but it could be that the SEC is like intentionally bumbling this Ripple case. But at any rate, I think it'll be very instructive for us to see how the Ripple case ends. And then that'll probably just double onto ETH, it would be my guess. So what, what, what <laughs> I love asking you these tough questions, but what, what do you, what are the odds you think at the end of the day? ETH gets labeled a security in the eyes of the U.S. government, in the eyes of the SEC, where Chairman Gary Gensler, according to this article, has hinted that his agency might consider ETH to be a security. What, 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 what are the odds you're giving this? Uh, 1%. <laughs> wow, in, really? Okay. Yeah, in its current form, I, I think it's almost, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to be able to win a court case where they argue that ETH in its current form as a network is a security. They might be able to argue that it was sold as a security, as, as an investment contract, but um, I think it's... Oh, when, when, it ha when in history, in case law, have we ever seen something that was sold as security that was then no longer considered a security? That's a great question. I can't think of a single one, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't exist, but I don't know. I, this this could uh, this could escalate pretty high in the legal system before we get a clear answer. It could, this could be something where the SEC does come down on it, you know, just throwing hypotheticals out there and then, you know, maybe it becomes a, a Supreme Court case or something where it's tested and the law is tested. Uh, the, the SEC took a pretty big loss um, today, I think. I, I read this news story just before the price report. Um, so GBTC and Grayscale was suing the SEC for denying their um, their uh, their spot ETF. So they have an ETF, but it's a futures based ETF. It's, it's based on the price um, and what's happening at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, not on the spot price of Bitcoin. So Grayscale sued the SEC saying that they're being inconsistent and unfair. And um, a judge, I don't I don't think they ruled anything yet, but they basically said that uh, they agree with Grayscale, that the SEC is being very unfair, um, that they're not applying the standard consistently. So, I mean, it, the SEC just when they have to go to court, they 
they, they seem like very powerful when they don't have to go to court, when they can just attack people with their massive infrastructure and resources. But when they actually have to go to court up against people that have billions of dollars, it seems like they have a much more difficult time um, arguing their case because we all see it. They're being completely unfair. They're, they're not being consistent. They're intentionally not providing solid, um, solid guidance. They, uh, they want the gray area. They want free lanes, free range to do whatever they, they want to do. So um, I, I think a lot of these court cases are going to set the tone here. And um, that will be great. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, all the scams and I, I hate Ripple. They, I think they falsely marketed themselves and all kinds of stuff with their partnerships. But um, I would rather deal with the problems of a few extra people or maybe even a lot of corporate scumbags kind of running around doing their scams, whatever than to have to deal with the problems attendant with a very centralized, powerful state that prevents you from doing any kind of innovation. Because mm -hmm. at least we can still do the innovation um, if we're not totally shut down by the government. So that would be my, my thinking on that. Let me hear you. I don't want to put you on the spot, but can, can you strong man the case as to why ETH could be considered a security? What, what do you think of the strong, your, our strongest arguments for it? Because, I, you know, I, I think about it. I think about ETH versus Monero. I think there's a much stronger case to be had for ETH being a security than something like Monero. So I, I guess the, the classic things that we're looking for is the Howey test, mm -hmm. um, where people sent funds to a common managerial pool with the expectation of profit derived solely from the efforts of those managers. And right now, you could call the Ethereum Foundation basically that sole managerial effort. They took the, I think it was 10%, they kept 10% of the supply when they did the presale, mm -hmm. and they still have a significant amount of that. So um, the work that they do is causing the value of the Ethereum token to rise. Yeah. So you could basically say that even the secondary sales, you could try and steel man argue that even those secondary sales of Ethereum are people depending on the managerial efforts of the Ethereum Foundation to increase the value of these tokens that they're holding. And whether it's a piece of paper, like a, like a stock, you know, where Hershey's back in the day, everyone just used to trade these paper stocks, or whether it's a digital um, a digital asset or digital, digital issuance, it's still the same concept. So you could definitely try to make a very good case that e even in its current form, is, uh, is very much uh, a security and investment contract, specifically when you point to some of the centralized um, providers of, um, uh, of like how to actually access the blockchain, right? We're talking like Infura and Consensus and uh, the kind of wallets and infrastructure. You could, you could show how centralized those guys are and how much, how connected they are to the Ethereum Foundation as well, and then try and wrap them up as part of the managerial effort as well. So exactly. That would be my steel man case. And then I think additionally is uh, proof proof of stake. I think there's arguments to be made how proof of stake kind of tends towards uh, potentially being uh, running into sec securities issues. What do you think? There? What's that? Uh, well, I guess we're. Asked, uh, I was going to say how so. Like I, I'm not. I don't quite see how proof of stake could um, necessarily boost the uh, the argument that ETH in its current form is a security. What's your connection there? What's your logic? Well, because people people are are staking the crypto, right? They're holding it with the expectation that it's going to go up in value, um, as opposed to proof of work mining. It's more direct, like you're you're making an investment with the uh, hope of a return on it. The SEC definitely ruled against um, Kraken recently, saying that um, staking on behalf of other people with the expectation of yield is a security. And then Kraken back down, they paid, I believe it was $30 million. That was very recently. Uh, I think uh, Tony covered that a couple weeks ago. I, I'm not sure like staking itself, I guess um, maybe, I mean, so you're, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that. It, it seems a little bit more tenuous, but. Yeah, it's more, it's more tenuous, but I think it's just another argument to be made. It's another step in the direction of, you know, getting a little closer towards you know, uh, reasonings for why it can be labeled a security, but yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, I, 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 I'd be very surprised if ETH was labeled a security in the U.S., but I don't know. Given how crazy things are, it's possible. 
Um, but yeah, let me let me let me keep going here. Uh, next story: Silvergate downfall sparks debate over whose fault it actually was. So we we covered this story pretty well. The demise of the crypto friendly bank has prompted discussion about who tipped the first domino and where crypto firms can turn for their banking needs. The voluntary liquidation of Silvergate has sparked many to share their thoughts about the source of its troubles and the broader impact of the crypto friendly bank's collapse on crypto. From lawmakers to crypto analysts, crypto firms, executives to commentators, nearly everyone's had something to say regarding the recent announcement from Silvergate. Some United States lawmakers have used the moment to make a comment about the state of the crypto industry, labeling it risky, volatile sector, which spreads risk across the financial system. Senator Elizabeth Warren called Silvergate's failure disappointed but predictable, calling for regulators to step up against crypto risk. So she she tweeted, as the bank of choice for crypto, Silvergate's bank, bank failure is disappointing but predictable. I warned of Silvergate's risk risky if not illegal activity and identified several due diligence failures now customers must be made whole and regulars should step up against crypto risk so they're using this as a moment to say we need more regulations we need we need to you know you know uh close in on crypto even more which leads to our our last story operation choke point 2.0 is the u.s coming for crypto so there's a lot of rumors out there that kind of all these recent moves uh you know the 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 biden administration talking about 30 percent tax uh things like the new york attorneys general's office is trying to label eth a uh, security the collapse of the silver get bank and the reaction of authorities um that operation choke point might be a real thing which is essentially the op operation of the u.s government to cut off crypto from the banking system um and so there's there's this theory out there that this is that this is real that there's a you know kind of a real joint effort among various arms of the government to crack down on crypto and to cut it off from the traditional banking system and or I'd say co-opted in a way where if it does exist with the traditional banking system, it exists in a way that the banks and by way of the banks, the government has control over it. So that's that's the news for today. It was a big week, big week all around.